Hey, how are you, Superintendent Carvalho? How's everything? Dr. Komatar, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. You know, thanks for joining us. I know this is some crazy times for you, and um, I, you know, really appreciate you taking half an hour out of your day. Oh, it's my pleasure. These are uh, important conversations that we need to have. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, we'll get right into it. I just want to do a very quick introduction for people who don't know who you are, but um, Superintendent Carvalho uh, has been superintendent of Miami-Dade County Public Schools since 2008. Uh, it's the fourth largest school district in the entire USA. Um, he is easily one of the most, if not the most, recognized superintendents in the country. I know he doesn't want me to brag about him, but uh, he's won a state superintendent and national superintendent of the year multiple times. So uh, obviously has a lot of experience. We wanna really uh, you know, see what his thoughts are on this pandemic and reopening of the schools, not only in Miami, but also nationwide, what, what really needs to be considered. Um, so let's just start uh, with going over, how difficult was it to shut down the schools um, in the spring when this first happened? I'm sure that was a very tough decision on your part. It, it was a tough decision because obviously much like most people I know, whether we're talking about parents, uh, teachers, or principals, you know, the best place to teach kids is in school with a physical experience where the social and emotional needs of kids are addressed, where the mental health needs of the kids are addressed, where the food needs of kids are addressed. However, uh, considering uh, the the manifestation of the pandemic as we knew it in our community. Uh, we had to be reasonable. We had to listen to the voices of science. And I think it was prudent at that time to actually shut down schools before the state announced the statewide shutdown of schools. And that was on March 13th. Uh, we were blessed with, uh, with the fact that we had um, taken steps earlier on in terms of connectivity, devices, content, curriculum, uh, to put in the hands of students and teachers to ensure that there would be a continuity of learning. And look, uh, it was not perfect, but the transition was seamless, meaning we achieved very quickly 100% connectivity with 100%, close to 100% of our children having devices in hand provided by the system. Uh, we distributed in excess of 120,000 devices and 10,000 hotspots. Uh, we achieved very high levels of teacher training at that time. But uh, we recognized that there were certain segments of the student population for a number of reasons that are known to us. Look, students with disabilities, English language learners, students in high poverty, uh, who connected, but they were not sufficiently engaged. What we've been doing over the summer is to improve upon uh, that experience for a much more seamless, organic, interactive, and engaged uh, sort of experience when we return to schooling on August 31st. I mean, that, that's, that's excellent. I guess maybe give us a little background. Who is on your committee and what information do you guys use when you're deciding how to open, when to reopen, when to pull back potentially? Who, who's on that committee and what data do you have? So, I don't know if you know or not, but, you know, I, I am uh, an accidental educator. And if I go back over 30 years, you know, my training was in sciences. I was going to be a medical doctor. And uh, my, my major was biology. My minor was physics and mathematics. So everything in my DNA is guided by scientific reasoning, by reason, uh, by data. And um, I felt it was important for us not only to monitor local data, national trends, local trends, but also international trends, we began to address the issue of uh, COVID-19, not in March, but actually in January, uh, when it was really a Yuhan China phenomenon. It had not transitioned to a pandemic. It was an epidemic in that country. And I remember placing it as a priority for discussion with my leadership team. And the question was, let's assume not if this virus hits our shores, but when it will hit our shores, what level of impact? And can we assume a worst case scenario? And for us, the worst case scenario would be the shutdown of schools. What will we do? Will we be ready? So our plan of action uh, began uh, its preparation back in January, accelerated through February. By March, we were ready to go. But 
we were informed by some of the best minds to your question uh, in the field, medical voices, public health voices. Uh, look, Dr. Schechter, Dr. Judy Marty, uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy, and I just described people amongst others who represent uh, the very top of consideration, research, knowledge, and understanding at the University of Miami Pediatrics, epidemiology at FIU, or a former Surgeon General of the United States of America, whose expertise is actually in infectious diseases. So those were the voices that informed our process, our decision making. And uh, respectfully, those are the voices that continue to inform the decision making process uh, we are engaged in. Not political voices, even though I know sometimes it's difficult. We listen to the voices of reason, the voices of science. So it's very science-based, which is, which is, I think, what everyone wants to hear. It's not politically based. It's, these are all science-based decisions. Uh, based on what you've heard and what your sources tell you, I mean, are kids really at risk of getting very sick with this? Or is it more that they're just a vector of transmission? Because that's a very important distinction. Doctor, you, you probably could answer that question better than I could. Uh, what I can tell you again from reading uh, the journal information, the scientific information, the peer reviewed uh, science, uh, not just uh, simplistic or superficial headlines, there are two points that are absolutely indisputable. Number one, children are susceptible to COVID-19. They are infected with COVID-19. It is true also that the research, vast amount of research, with few exceptions, uh, demonstrate that children will not manifest the symptoms to the severity uh, that adults will. With that said, with that said, they, particularly children from the ages of 10 to 18, appear uh, to be not only infected with COVID-19, as often as or as frequently as anybody else, but they pass it on. They are, as you said, vectors to other individuals who are more susceptible, not only to the viral infection, but to the actual development mm -hmm. of the disease with all of its nefarious and the consequential uh, you know, impacts. So for those who simplistically want to say, you know, children are safe, uh, they are ignoring a strong part uh, of the research. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I would say that, you know, along those lines, what, what type of concern have you received from teachers and staff, people who might be older, sicker, have medical comorbidities, uh, what type of protection are you giving for those older population that are working in the schools? So one of the benefits that Miami-Dade County Public Schools has is we are a self-insured entity, which means we own our own claims. We know uh, what the health of our workforce is. We know uh, what the cost points are. We know where the vulnerabilities are. We also know uh, the average age of work groups in our workforce. We understand the disproportionate vulnerability that individuals with underlying health conditions have uh, to COVID-19. So what we have heard is quite frankly, uh, common sense. Older people, individuals who have underlying health concerns uh, are at particular risk and have voiced their concern to us. That's why the decisions that we have made, not only in terms of postponing the start of the school year, uh, from August 24th to the 31st, uh, but also to start at least the first month uh, through my school online are the appropriate steps to take. Recognizing that all through the process, informed by the medical experts and public health experts that I described, we will examine the data on a daily, weekly basis, pay close attention to the gating criteria that we believe is important, such as the positivity rate, not only a static positivity rate that's specific to one day, but a 14-day trend, the number of hospitalizations, uh, mortality, uh, capacity, percentage utilization capacity of ICU, and also the viral strength, the total numbers of cases in our community. 
And there are eight criteria, metrics that we're looking at as advised by our health council uh, that uh, we monitor around the clock. And uh, I believe by now, since we have informed our workforce, that that's exactly the data that our workforce is actually following. And by the way, that's what we should be doing. I mean, I think the health, the well-being, the safety, security of population, whether it's a school population, a city's population, a county's population, a nation's population, ought to be guided by expert advice and scientific data, regardless of what the political implications may be. And regardless of consequence to self, that's exactly what I'll be doing. And, you know, so it seems like it's a very fluid system, meaning that you guys can very quickly pivot and go back if the numbers start going up. And conversely, you guys can open up more if the numbers keep going down. I think that's important for everyone to know. Maybe you can just go, you know, into your system a little bit, um, which is the reopen smart um, and return safe has three different options at home, 100 percent a mixed hybrid model, and then a pure uh, in-person uh, model. Maybe just talk a little bit about those phases and those different options for the parents. Sure. So we've actually have uh, ditched the hybrid model because it was not popular with parents. We have been surveying parents and teachers quite a bit. And uh, I tell you, the community is almost evenly divided. You know, we posed two important questions, a number of questions, but the two salient questions were, number one, do you prefer a continuation of uh, distance learning? My school online, by the way, significantly enhanced from the last fall with a single platform, single sign on. Parents and students and teachers will not have to uh, hop and skip between different applications. You sign on to one platform and you address all your needs with consistent attendance being taken with accountability for everybody. So that was one question. 51% of the parents, uh, last time we surveyed, said, look, we, preferred, we prefer that approach. About 49% uh, percent of the parents said, if conditions allow, and that's one important qualifier, if environmental health conditions in a community allow it, we would love to return our kids back to the schoolhouse. So we have almost a 50-50 split. That's where we are. That's why on August 31st, followed by a week of intense training for teachers on the platform, but also a week of orientation for students and parents. We will begin the schooling year uh, through my school online, but we will be ready to pivot, particularly for the parents who opt for the schoolhouse model uh, on a fly. The way we are scheduling kids, when the conditions are appropriate, whether they are by September 30th, a little earlier, or a little bit later, we will be able to pivot very, very quickly to allow both sets of options to be coexistent based on the parental choice, which is important to me. Well, that's wonderful to hear that, that there's, there's options and you guys are taking into account data real time so that you can adjust appropriately. Um, how important is it uh, to physically get the kids back to school, not only for the parents, and their professional lives, but also just socialization of the kids. Uh, you know, I mean, especially younger kids, you know, being at home the entire time, that quarantine can have a lot of, a lot of effects on children. So how important is it for them to be with their friends socializing? Uh, critically important. Look, I'm one who's doing all that I can, and I keep urging the community to do all that the community can to engage in behaviors that will actually impact the curve of positivity. Um, look, seven weeks, eight weeks ago, we were at a positivity rate of 6% at a time when New York City was at double digits. New York City today is anywhere between one and 3%, where Miami-Dade hit an all-time high of 31%, uh, to then now stabilize around 13 to 14%. We had a sort of a bad data a couple of days ago because of delays in the release of data from some testing sites. And I really want to talk about uh, testing and, and contact tracing and how important its effectiveness is for us to be able to reopen schools. Uh, but uh, look, the social emotional needs of students, the mental health, the socialization, particularly for kids who are young, 
uh, on the other side of the spectrum, and this is really difficult to speak about, but look, we know that uh, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse is a sad reality in our community. In many instances, it is possible that the abuser is now sequestered at home with the abuse with a child. And the point of detection is usually the schoolhouse. So we are doing all that we can uh, to accelerate the return of kids back to school. But health conditions need to reach a point where it's reasonable and safe to do so. That's why I keep appealing to the community, do what you can, wear your darn mask. This is not a political statement, maintain social distancing. Do not congregate with large groups of people. The faster and the better you do that, the lower the positivity rate and the faster our kids are back in the best place they could be in, which is school. I mean, it seems so simple what you're saying, and I think it is simple if people would just, just follow three simple things wash your hands, wear a mask, and just socially distance. But for some reason, that's very difficult for most people. Um, I don't think people understand how inclusive your plan needs to be. So for example, what about the cafeteria? What about school buses? These are all things that I think people take for granted, but they don't realize how you have to literally take into account every single socialization step of schooling. And what are you guys doing about lunches, cafeteria, school buses? Yeah, you know, this pandemic didn't just change or force a change to one dimension of what we do. It changed everything. And by the way, I think it has changed everything around our lives, the way we socialize, the way we entertain ourselves, the way we celebrate whatever it may be, a birthday or a graduation. And in schools, it's no different. So we have developed plans for the transportation of students that follow uh, very specific guidelines, enhanced CDC guidelines, which have changed over time, ensuring that there is social distancing in buses, ensuring that kids, when they, uh, when they uh, get on the bus, they are able to disinfect their hands, ensuring that the, uh, the bus driver is protected with an acrylic enclosure, it makes sense. Uh, upon leaving the bus, entering the school, uh, there will be a requirement for facial uh, masks for the protection of teachers, students alike, to the extent possible, social distancing, the utilization of non-traditional spaces to maximize social distancing. Also, a utilization threshold of 75% for all schools so that no school is at a percent utilization uh, that creates overcrowded conditions. A possibly different way of distributing food, so in many cases, uh, students may actually have the Uber version of the school meal delivered to the classroom rather than them congregating in the cafeteria. A lot more outdoor activities, but it goes beyond that. I mean, we are providing, uh, I don't know if the community knows this, an infrared thermometer to every single family in Miami-Dade County Public Schools free of cost. And our request, the same for our employees, is take your temperature before you leave the house. Now, understanding that you may get some, uh, you know, some uh, false negatives, that your temperature may be okay because you may be a carrier of the virus, but absolutely a asymptomatic. That's why, however, we want parents to take the temperature of their children at home, but then we will have two isolation centers in every school uh, staffed by nurses should there be uh, a declaration of a symptom while in school, and we are able to isolate those individuals. Now, the point I wanted to make it earlier, look, I've now gotten tested twice. The first time it took 10 days for me to get my test results. You and I know, you and I know, if contact tracing is to be effective, a 10 day turnaround time is uh, insufficient. Uh, we need a turnaround time of no more than 48 hours for contact tracing to be effective, particularly when we bring kids and teachers back to school. We have advanced technologies to make it work, but we are still dependent. Are you there? Oh, we just locked up here. Hold on. I think he froze here. Hold on.
Oh, hold on. You got disconnected. Hold that thought. Oh, there you are. Sorry about that. Oh. Sorry we lost you there for a That's second. That's okay. We're back. Yeah, so I was just going to say, obviously, it's going to be tricky in the fall once it's flu season as well. That's going to throw a whole nother wrinkle into the game. So um, what are you guys doing about sports? Obviously, this is a huge issue when it comes to college sports. Uh, several major conferences have said no fall sports, including the Ivy Leagues. Uh, what are your guys' take on high school sports? Look, I think extracurricular activities and sports are important in the lives of kids. But obviously, the same uh, preventive measures, precautions need to be taken. In fact, I believe that just this morning, the FH, FHSAA, the Florida uh, High School Athletic Association, has decreed that come August 24th, uh, training, conditioning can begin. And we are ready to do that in a careful, protected way, outdoors, where equipment is not swapped between athletes. But let's not forget one thing. All of our athletes in middle school and high school are scholar athletes. Our first priority is their scholastic success. Secondly, their athletic opportunity. And for me, that is important. So I believe that after August 24th, we can begin uh, some degree of physical conditioning, some degree of training, understanding that the conditions are appropriate social distancing is allowed and outdoor practice uh, is the rule not the exception yeah i mean that that totally makes sense so we're running out of time here i just want to ask one last question but um what about kids who have special needs kids that obviously can't just do online learning but there's a physical nature to their education are there any considerations for what they're going to be doing during the pandemic uh, absolutely doctor so one of my biggest concerns has been fragile children, uh, who I know for a fact, as a result of the dis disruption of the last fourth quarter and then the summer, they have experienced an academic regression, a slide the likes of which our nation has never seen. Uh, that is why uh, we actually created two virtual academic sessions to catch them up. And it is my plan, and we are hard at work at exploring after August 31st, soon after August 31st, bringing waves of students, the neediest, most fragile students, who did not succeed and continue to struggle uh, through distance learning back to the schoolhouse in a very limited, in a very protective way, with all of the PPEs and the social distancing and the training required. I believe it is both our moral and legal duty to do so for some of the most fragile populations of students. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, it's been half an hour. I don't want to take up any more of your time. I know how busy you are. I just want to say thank you for all you've done and all you continue to do. Obviously, these are unprecedented times. Uh, and we appreciate all your leadership and all your decision making. Doctor, I appreciate the opportunity. And, uh, you know, one last thing, if I could say it. A lot of people are putting a lot of pressure on school systems, not only here, but across America. But understand that most school systems, all the principals and teachers that I know, the school board, we want kids in the best place we know exists to teach them. That's the schoolhouse. Uh, we are ready. The community is not. The environmental, the health conditions in our community are still comparable today to what they were in China back in January. We have to ask ourselves if New York was able to emerge from America's epicenter to a positivity rate between one and 3%, why can't Miami-Dade? I think we ought to focus our efforts on that, mitigate our own behaviors so that our children can return to the best place where they can be taught, which is the schoolhouse. Thank you very much for the opportunity. All right, take care. All right. Thank you.